help! The doctor and Romana cried in unison at the top of their lungs. As they did so, a single black rat took a determined step towards them. A single black rat might not seem to demand the level of concern displayed by the two Time Lords, even if one allowed for the fact that this particular black rat could drive someone mad with the merest touch, their concern might still seem a little disproportionate. However, once one realised that this was but an advance guard for a sea of such rats, filling the library they now stood in, their consternation became fully justified. Indeed, this sea of rats was now bubbling right up to the surface upon which they stood, a surface which formed the very tops of the towering bookshelves of the Mondasian Parliament Library. The Time Lords backed away a little, but were rapidly running out of rat-free areas of safety. Just then, the Doctor's knees began to buckle, and Romana looked at once, horrified and confused. She realised the Doctor's foot had brushed against a second rat, throwing his mind into bedlam, but for a moment she seemed utterly undecided as to what to do. Then, just as the Doctor was about to tumble off the bookcase, she reached forward, grabbed his shoulders and pulled him to her. The Doctor's head swam around sickeningly on his loose neck until his bleary eyes half-focused on Romana. "'Would anyone care for a jelly baby?' he asked oddly. Then he shook himself, saying, "'I'm fine. Just a momentary lapse. I don't have any jelly babies.' The hatch above their heads popped open, and a black-hooded head and shoulders poked through, surveying the scene coolly. However, they were clearly struggling to maintain their nonchalance, given the bizarre vision before them. "'Well, do you want to stay here?' A strangely familiar voice said sarcastically, while the figure thrust a black-clad arm down towards the companions. "'Quick, give me a leg up,' Romana told the doctor. The doctor duly obliged, and Romana was hoisted up within reach of their rescuer. They linked arms, and she was swiftly pulled to safety. The doctor looked around him now and realised he had run out of time. No longer were there only two rats atop the racks. The rat horde was washing up over the edges of the bookcase and were rapidly converging upon him from all sides. Doctor! Jump! Romana shouted. Her shoulders and arms had also appeared in the hatch, and together with the newcomer were waiting to catch the doctor. The doctor looked far from confident in this plan, but nevertheless crouched low to the rapidly disappearing surface. Then he leapt, straight up, arms outstretched. For a sickening moment he felt himself pass the point of maximum elevation and begin to fall. Then hands grasped both his forearms and he realised he was saved. Romana and the stranger pulled him through the hole in the ceiling, and together they all fell back upon the rough attic floor, gasping for breath. The doctor had only taken a single lungful before he was on his feet. He grabbed the wooden hatch cover and dropped it neatly into place, sealing the rat horde into the library. At least that's what he hoped. The doctor now turned to face their apparent saviour. We are very much obliged to you, Mr... The doctor's statement petered out as a question. Speaker. The night speaker corrected, squaring his shoulders and rocking side to side on his heels slightly, challengingly. Speaker de Tour. He continued coolly. Lael de Tour. At your service, I suppose. Though I'm not usually so free with my services. Then we are all the more grateful, Speaker de Tour. Romana offered politely. But what brought you to be so fortuitously placed? Up here, I mean, so you could help us. Lael grinned slyly. The attic spaces are very useful in my line of work, for discreet movement, so to speak. Are you a member of the Thieves' Guild? the doctor asked casually. What? Get out! the night speaker cried indignantly. I ain't no lifter. I have an honourable trade. Can't you tell from my garb? The doctor spread his hands placatingly. No offence was meant, I assure you. It's just that to foreign travellers such as ourselves, the uniform of the night court are hard to tell apart. At this, the night speaker looked even more put out. He means... Romana interjected hurriedly that the subtle intricacies of your outfit are just too artful and complex for us to interpret. Lael de Tour frowned, but looked a little less displeased. He spread his arms wide, hands just above waist height. This is the outfit of the Dealers Guild, and you are looking at its leader. Cars? the doctor asked innocently. Lael tutted and shook his head. Pleasures. Release. Freedom. 
As the night speaker said each word, he opened a different pouch on his belt and half-exposed clear bags, each containing a different powder or dried substance. These came in a wide variety of colours. Ah, the doctor said, nodding knowingly. Drugs. The doctor took a step towards the speaker and raised a conspiratorial hand to talk behind. But aren't they illegal? The doctor said with theatrically hushed tones. The night speaker cocked his head, praising the doctor. You know, you don't strike me as someone shy of bending the rules a little. The doctor waggled his own head noncommittally. Well, maybe. But aren't drugs terribly dangerous and addictive? Can't they kill you if taken to excess? Or at least seriously damage your health? Lael shook his head. Not necessarily. Not all of them the same. Even the riskiest of them can be handled safely, if you use sense and moderation. But that's down to the buyer, of course. But don't you expose them to the risks? The doctor countered. I provide a service. Nothing more, nothing less. And everything you've said, everything I said, could just as well apply to bacon. Perhaps we should make the Butcher's Guild illegal too. Lael asked with a smirk. The doctor raised his hands. I take your point. He conceded. Still... He continued, What brings you to this attic above the library? To where were you transporting? Lael held up a finger. Oh, I think I've answered enough for now. I'll get back to you on that one. I think it's time you did some explaining. What the hell was going on down there? Well, the doctor responded breezily, Parliament seems to have something of a rat problem. Come now, Lael began, then trailed off as he realised he had no names for his guests. The doctor... The doctor supplied helpfully. Romana. Romana followed suit. Come now, doctor, Romana. I thought we were being straight with each other. The doctor thought for a moment, choosing his words carefully. Something has altered these rats. They are swarming and are being controlled. Controlled? Lael asked with some doubt. By these the doctor said, retrieving the brass sphere from his pocket and handing it briefly to Lael. Lael inspected it before handing it back. Do you recognise it? The doctor asked. Lael looked unsure. The case looks like something the tech guilds would produce. There's no maker's mark. They always leave one, however discreet. It's a pride thing. But that's completely unsigned. You should ask the head of the technical caucus what he thinks, Lael suggested. The doctor looked awkward. We would love to... Except he was killed by the rats in the library just before we arrived. Killed by the rats? Gods, how? The doctor shook his head again. The details are too complicated and gruesome to go into right now. Will you help us find out what is causing this and stop it? <laughs> People bumping off the day parliament is no skin off my nose, Lael Detour replied with a snort. The doctor looked disapprovingly at him. You all share the same parliament, the same city, the same planet. Day or night, what affects one affects the other. Will you help us and help yourself at least? Detour considered his words. Recess is almost over. I have to get back to my chair. But find me if you need me and I'll see what I can do. No promises, though. The doctor nodded. Fair enough. We won't hold you to it. With that, Lael de Tour crept off along the attic to be lost in the shadows. Romana turned to the doctor. He never did say why he was up here. The doctor shrugged. Perhaps you can ask him later. Can we trust him? Romana asked. I mean, for all we know, he could be behind this bulk master murder. Then why rescue us? The doctor responded. We simply do not have all the facts. And until we do, we should not build a theory in their absence, lest we force future facts to fit. Romano looked quizzically at the doctor and his somewhat unusual turn of phrase. There is something oddly familiar in your words, but I can't quite put my finger on exactly what. The doctor smiled mysteriously. Perhaps I'm inspired by another great mind, who can say? But the words are mine, as far as I'm aware. So, what now, doctor? Romano asked. The doctor pulled out the brass sphere and held it aloft, while glancing down at the hatch he'd so recently sealed. 
Well, I think we should wait for things to calm down a little before examining the crime scene. So for now, let us examine this... thing... back in the comfort of the TARDIS. Romana nodded, and together they began to search for an alternative route down into the corridors of the North Wing. It appears to be a frequency generator, Master, K-9 chirped efficiently. Just a simple signal generator, Romana asked with a trace of disappointment. Negative, Mistress, K-9 replied. The Doctor held up a finger to forestall another argument between Romana and the robot. I think what K-9 means is it is anything but simple, he said, picking up the brass sphere from the floor in front of K-9 and placing it in a small receptacle on one of the panels of the main console. He then withdrew his sonic screwdriver from his pocket and scanned the artifact with one hand while simultaneously flipping various switches on the main console with the other. At last he turned back to Romana. It transmits a space-time vibration using micro-warping technology. But more than that, it is transmitting beyond our four-dimensional existence into the eleven-dimensional bulk itself. It attracts those rats to its location while operational, creating the swarm we witnessed. But it also draws still more of the bulk creatures into our realm and in doing so it increases the rate at which this space-time fragment dissolves, here and now, and eventually everywhere. Whoever or whatever is causing this, for whatever reason, must be stopped. Romana shook her head in disbelief. Such advanced technology. Who would have the knowledge to make such a thing here? And why would they? Excellent questions, the doctor exclaimed. But we won't find any answers here he continued. I'm afraid it's another trip to the library for us. Romana shuddered, but nodded her agreement. The Doctor and Romana found themselves once more before the oh-so-inviting heavy wooden doors of the library. With a deep breath, the Doctor opened one door. The scene before them was much as it had been earlier, not a black rat in sight, merely row upon row of towering bookshelves. Together, the Time Lords trod warily through the opening. They crept once more between the stacks, there were virtually no signs of the earlier rat invasion, beyond the few books scattered on the floor where they had previously desperately scaled the bookcase. However, as they approached the location of Simon Brunson's body, they once more saw his boots poking out from between the stacks. They walked to his twisted corpse and found it much as it had been before, a sight not easy to stomach. The second brass sphere still lay upon the floor nearby. The doctor scanned it briefly. It's dead, drained, he announced before asking, Do you remember which way it came from? Romana nodded and pointed. That way, I think. The doctor indicated his understanding and headed off in the direction she had pointed. Midway toward the bookshelf-clad wall ahead, the doctor stopped and looked behind him, allowing the apparently dawdling Romana to catch up. Together they began to examine the shelves for any sign as to where the second sphere might have come from. There came a sudden click and a delighted gasp from Romana. The doctor turned and saw that she had tilted one book forward in its place, and this had caused the shelf to rotate slightly into and out of the wall. With Romana pulling and the doctor pushing, they swung the shelf through ninety degrees to reveal a hidden passage running behind the wall. It was dark, narrow, and smelt very musty. It would be churlish to turn our noses up at such a fortuitous discovery, don't you think? The doctor suggested to Romana. Romana raised a signature eyebrow. Oh, yes. She responded with the slightest air of sarcasm. This is making me feel very lucky. The doctor ignored her tone, nodded, and eased himself into the narrow corridor. Romana shook her head and followed. The doctor used a tiny light emitted by a sonic screwdriver to help shine their way, inadequate as it was. The main hidden passage seemed to run around the external walls of the wings of the Mondasian Parliament quadrangle. Periodically they had to duck under shafts driven through the passage, presumably where windows lay. Occasionally, side passengers emerged, which must have corresponded to the interior walls. Finally, the Doctor and Romana reached a corner of the building and stumbled upon an unexpected feature. Set back from the passage, even deeper into the wall they were travelling in, was a tight little stone spiral staircase leading down. Just then, Romana and the Doctor stiffened as they heard a scuttling noise somewhere nearby. It appeared to get louder and closer. Then the Time Lords gave a sigh of relief as the sound faded. Whatever it was must have taken an alternative path. Onwards and downwards? The doctor whispered. Romana shrugged her resigned acquiescence. Down they spiralled, 
deeper and deeper into the hidden confines of the building. It became clear that they must have already passed the floor at ground level and were now going deep into the island upon which the complex had been built. It was painfully obvious to the Time Lords that if a horde of black rats were to appear at any moment, or even a single such rodent, it would be impossible to evade them. That would be an end to it all, as their sanity fled. At last they reached the bottom of the stairs, and in the dim light of the screwdriver they could just make out a sizable chamber. The illumination was too feeble to discern any... features in the depths of this new space. Fortunately, the doctor was able to see a tall brazier nearby, which, after fishing around in his jacket for a while, he was able to light with a match. The flickering firelight rendered the macabre scene before them even more eerie, as twisted shadows leapt around the high-vaulted chamber. Some distance beyond Romana and the doctor stood a stone lectern with a book open upon it. Next to this stood a matching stone plinth, with about half a dozen more tomes piled somewhat haphazardly upon it. It was what lay beyond these stone furnishings which was by far the most disturbing feature of this room. A statue, eight feet tall and utterly alien. Its trunk-like body grew up from the floor before breaking out into a multitude of branches or perhaps tentacles, contorting and reaching upwards towards the ceiling. Each branch ended in a slightly broader paddle-like extension. Its colour, as much as the unreliable light would reveal, seemed to be a sickly greenish-brown. Another possible trick of the dancing flames, the statue seemed to exhaust the eyes if looked upon for any length of time. The stained glass window, Romana said in hushed tones. It's the same thing. The doctor nodded and Romana took a step forward. The doctor grabbed her upper arm to halt her advance. Do not lick it. I'm not sure it is a statue. Romana looked at the doctor with some impatience. I wasn't going to but it is not moving, no matter the impression the torchlight gives. The doctor shook his head. It may not appear to be moving from our perspective, but I do not believe we are looking at a statue, not in the usual sense. Do not touch it, he said gravely. Romana gave her silent assent, and together they cautiously approached the lectern and plinth. The doctor began to read the ancient leather-bound tome left open there, while Romana began examining the pile of books on the plinth. It's as I thought, as I feared, the doctor announced darkly as he looked up from the musty volume. How so? Romana inquired. The doctor steeled himself to deliver bad news. This place is a weak spot, a point in our universe where it has always been a little less isolated from the bulk. It's possible it's always been this way, even before our universe fragmented. The monks here worshipped an entity or entities of the bulk, they may have even communed with them on some level. Somebody may still be doing so. As he made this last observation, he withdrew the brass seer from his pocket to emphasise his point. This dramatic gesture was lost on Romana, however, who was removing one tome from the pile on the plinth, her eyes wide. Doctor, look! She gasped, proffering the book to him. The doctor pocketed the sphere, accepted the text, and began to flick through it. Yes, well, very interesting. It's clearly a little newer than some of the books here, maybe only a century or two old. A little dry, perhaps. A technical manual more than anything else. On multidimensional transmission. Yes, I can see this might well form the basis for the construction of the Sears. Well done, Romana. The doctor concluded with a half-hearted, largely disinterested congratulation. Romana could not help herself as her eyes once more swivelled in exasperation. She put her hand over the top of the book onto the pages and ran her finger back and forth along the text, seemingly at random. Doctor, you are missing the point. The doctor frowned and stared intently at the pages. Then his eyes widened in horror as the realisation finally struck him. It's in Gallifreyan! He gasped. He closed the book and placed it on top of the others, his face utterly grim. I may have made a terrible mistake. Romana smiled and tried, with only the merest hint of condescension, to bat this away. Oh, come now, Doctor. A trivial one. Reading other languages is second nature to us. It is basically in our blood. It's easy for us to forget to look at the form of the text itself and see the underlying language. The Doctor fixed her with a hard stare. That is not the mistake I mean. But this may well come down to blood. Bad blood. Very bad indeed. 
Romano looked quizzically at the doctor and not a little nervously. What do you mean? I need to talk to the night speaker, he said simply. I see. Romano responded, then pointed to the darkness beyond the bulk creature's statue. I think I can see another exit over there. Shouldn't we check it out? Later, the doctor replied firmly. But yes, we may well need to do that at some point. The doctor began to turn towards the entrance they came in by, but paused as he saw Romano pick up the Gallifreyan text once more. What the devil do you want that for? he asked impatiently. Romano shrugged as she grappled with the sizable tome. You never know. It might come in handy. <laughs> well, if you really feel you need the exercise, the doctor conceded with a single chuckle. Together, the Time Lords mounted the stairs once more. As they made their way back through the secret passages, an odd noise made them pause. Their footfalls had at first made it unclear, but now they were still, it could be plainly heard. It was a slowly repeating thump coming from the other side of the wall. Knock, knock, the doctor said to Romana, one eyebrow raised. Who's there? Romana responded with a somewhat resigned smile. They began to examine the wall, looking for signs of a door. The doctor's hand brushed over a small, discreet, but not particularly hidden lever. No need to conceal the mechanisms once you're already inside a secret passage, he mused to himself. He pulled the lever, and a section of wall immediately in front of him swung outwards and away. The doctor choked and struggled as two hands grasped his throat with a frenzied grip and dragged him, gasping, into the room beyond. He was swung around violently and flung against the opposite wall, those clawing hands never losing their deadly hold. Zwaheb! Zwaheb! The doctor's assailant screamed into his face, spittle flying from his foam-flecked mouth. The man was quite portly, his forehead bloody, and his eyes wide and staring. He was quite, quite mad. There came a sickeningly meaty thud, and those same wild eyes rolled up into his head, then closed. He slumped to the floor, unmoving. The doctor's view no longer obscured, he found himself staring at Romana, the large volume they'd found earlier clutched in her hands. I told you it might come in handy, she said with a shrug. The doctor knelt down next to the man and felt for his pulse. He's still alive, just unconscious, for now, the doctor informed Romana. Quickly! Help me tie him up so he can't do himself or anyone else more harm. Using the man's own belt, computer cables gathered from the office, and whatever else came to hand, they both began securing his hands and feet. Physically, anyway, the doctor continued. I fear the mental damage will be irreparable to poor... The doctor paused and looked towards the nearby desk. He found the nameplate he was looking for. Mr. Burfolk. He finished slowly. My, my. Romana responded as she looked down at the head of the Butcher's Guild. Someone really does seem to have it in for the day Parliament, don't they? So it would seem. The Doctor replied, somewhat distantly. The Doctor and Romana entered the main Parliament building via the Night Bell Tower entrance. Consequently, they were almost immediately under the Night Speaker's throne. Some very long-winded speech seemed underway by one of the members of the court, and so the doctor waved up at the night speaker as discreetly as possible to attract his attention. Lael de Tour saw them and gave an impatient sigh. Nevertheless, he subtly beckoned for them to climb the steps which ran up to him from behind and beside the throne itself. "'What do you want?' he hissed angrily at them. "'Just one thing,' the doctor said, holding up a finger. "'Which is?' What was the name of the Mayor of Mondas under the Three Tyrants? Lael frowned. You mean the secret name? The one lost to history? You know what lost means, right? The doctor shook his head. I mean his real name. Lael shrugged. Oh, that's easy. He was Mayor Bayer. The doctor's face looked ashen. Thank you the doctor said faintly. It's a common enough name, the night speaker replied almost helpfully. The family persists this day. It's not like we hold the sins of the father against the children. The doctor nodded slowly. Very enlightened of you, he noted quietly. Thank you, he added once more before descending the stairs, Romana clambering with him. The night speaker watched their departure and stroked his chin thoughtfully. The doctor had insisted they return to the secret passages. As they traversed the narrow crawlways, Romana interrogated the doctor. What is it, doctor? She asked. 
Why is the name of the mayor so important? Bad blood, the doctor answered simply. Oh, come now, doctor, Romana chided. You heard, Leo. Even they don't believe in inherited evil. As Time Lords educate and evolved, we certainly do not. The doctor stopped in his tracks and turned to face Romana. Depending upon whether the bloodline comes from the original mayor or from one of the three tyrants, realistically only two of them, I suspect, things may be very bad indeed. We may not be dealing with a full Mondasian at all. In the worst case, they may have powers and abilities even they may not imagine, and an inheritance which might drive them to evil, whether they realise it or not. Again, Romana rejected the thought. Even if they have inherited traits of other species, we don't tend to write off an entire line as irredeemably corrupt. The doctor stared Romana in the eye. I have certainly hoped that in the past. I still hope that may be true. In general, it must be so. However, there are always exceptions. Some hearts beat to a different rhythm. The rhythm of war. The rhythm of ruin. And that is a beat which can be hard to still. Perhaps impossible. With that last thought left hanging, they continued on their way. Now they found themselves in front of the twisted statue of the bulk creature. Taking great care not to touch any part of it, the two Time Lords edged around to reach the exit Romana had spotted earlier. Here they found another spiral stone staircase climbing upwards. The Doctor took the lead as they ascended. At last they reached the top and were confronted not by a corridor, as with the first set of stairs, but instead a blank wall. In a moment, the Doctor had found the release lever and pulled it. The room now revealed to the Doctor and Romana, by the swinging open of a bookcase, was instantly recognisable. Even if it had not been, the presence of Jian, the day speaker, sitting behind her desk, would have confirmed their location. She stared at them as they stepped through the opening, but her composure was surprisingly unruffled. Come in, come in, she said politely. I'm not used to receiving guests from my wall, but you're always welcome. Thank you, the doctor replied cordially. Most generous of you. I was wondering if you might ask you one or two questions. Jeanne inclined her head. Naturally, I am at your disposal as always. We have made some disturbing discoveries, the doctor began. That is not a question. Jeanne countered with a smile. The doctor did not return this gesture. Simon Brunson is dead. He stated simply. How terrible. Jian responded calmly. As is Nornard Burfok, the doctor continued, at least mentally. How? Jian asked with a slight tone of shock. They were both attacked by creatures from beyond the confines of this universe and driven mad. That sounds very hard to imagine. Jian responded. The entire building is riddled with secret passages, the doctor said, jerking his thumb behind himself and Romana towards the opening, and they lead to an ancient temple beneath our very feet. This tale sounds quite incredible, Jian offered, but very exciting. One entrance to the temple led here, and only here. Jian spread her hands. I feel honoured, but tell me, how were these, um, creatures set upon my friends and colleagues? The doctor withdrew the brass sphere from his pocket and handed it to the day speaker. This device, he began, designed using texts hidden in the temple and built illicitly, no doubt, via the technical guilds. When functional, it lures the creatures to a given location. The slightest touch of one creature alone is enough to destroy the mind. Do you recognize it? Jeanne sighed, shaking her head. One should be careful of what one makes, she said with an air of weary resignation. Then she pocketed the device deep within her ceremonial apron. And to whom one gives it? She finished before ringing a small bell upon her desk. Instantly, the leftmost of the two doors behind her opened and in strode a dark, imposing figure toting a small energy rifle. This weapon was immediately trained upon the Doctor and Romana. The black metal bucket of a helmet completely obscured the face, and a sizable black fur cloak largely obscured the body. The attire was instantly recognisable as that of a Levithian mercenary, unchanged for centuries before, 
and indeed for centuries still to come. One slight feature of note was that, from the shape of what could be seen of the soft leather armour beneath the cloak, this warrior was a woman. Are you sure you want to talk in front of her? The doctor asked. Talk? Jeanne responded with surprise. My intention is to have her kill you right now. Your idea amuses me, and the Vithian mercenaries are as discreet as they are loyal. So, what exactly are you dying to know? The doctor fixed her with a steely stare. Why? Why? <laughs> the word burst forth from Jeanne with a laugh. Why did I seek to remove obstacles to what was rightfully mine? You know now my family, I suspect. Once the most powerful family on all of Mondas. Respected, feared, obeyed. And what was I? The butt of every joke in this pathetic parliament. So, I got Simon to build a device you so helpfully returned to me, though he was ignorant of its function. Still, he was both a loose end, in need of tying, and an obstacle to my rising power. And so, poof. Two birds with one stone, so to speak. And Nornard? The doctor interrupted. Well, he was the more immediate impediment to my advance. His removal would ease my way to the head of the Butcher's Guild. The first step in my, hopefully, meteoric rise. Seaman cleared out could only accelerate my plans. How? Romana asked. Jeanne turned to her, looking a little surprised. A question each, eh? Ah oh, well, fair's fair, I suppose. How? Do you mean how did I come up with such an ingenious plan with such ingenious devices and otherworldly aid? Yes. Romana said coolly. That's exactly what I mean. Jeanne chuckled to herself. You see, as with everything with me, it's all in the family. Did you know that our family owned the old monastery before the time of the three tyrants? No? Well, after the mayor was deposed, the remaining members of the family gave it to the city as an act of contrition to save their skins. But the family kept many secrets to itself. Some old legends of the worship and ceremonies conducted here for centuries. Other more recent tales of investigation conducted by the three tyrants themselves. I found the passages, found the temple, and found the text. It was simplicity itself to read and understand them. It was almost as if it were a second nature to me. Romana raised an eyebrow. And you had no difficulty reading the text. All of them, without exception. Jeanne looked momentarily confused and not a little offended. No, of course not. Why would I? She asked indignantly. Oh, no particular reason, Romana replied casually. It's just interesting. Jeanne sneered at Romana and the doctor. Well, I do hope your interest is fully satisfied, because unfortunately that is all you have time for. With that, the day speaker clicked her fingers at the mercenary and pointed to the doctor and Romana. The doctor felt Romana's hand suddenly upon his shoulder, gripping it in fear. The mercenary seemed to pause, looking first at the doctor, then Romana. Then she lowered her rifle and slowly backed out of the same door she had entered by, closing it behind her. Useless bloody Levithian scum! Jian shrieked in fury. Before the doctor and Romana could act, the day speaker had recovered an energy pistol from her desk and instantly had it trained on the Time Lords herself. If you want anything done right, you have to... Before she could finish, there was a blur and rush of air as something fell from the ceiling to land on the desk, knocking the gun from Jeanne's grip. Hello, day speaker, Lael said with a grim smile. Isn't this a little dark for you? Jeanne screamed wordlessly and bolted through that same door so recently utilised by her lacklustre mercenary. Quick! the doctor cried. She has to be stopped! The doctor and Romana dashed after the day speaker. The night speaker shrugged, and with somewhat less resolve followed after them. The door they had passed through led to a small set of internal stairs, which in turn led to a ground floor exit onto the lawn surrounding the main parliament chamber. Although the sun had not yet risen, the dim light of dawn was beginning to show through, and with it they could make out Jeanne running for the day bell tower. The doctor, Romana, and the night speaker pelted after her. The day speaker had already entered the bell tower by the time the trio reached its door. As one, they burst through and stopped dead at the sight before them. The attendant bell ringer lay on the floor, presumably clubbed from behind by a desperate day speaker. Whether they were dead or merely unconscious was unclear at this point. Meanwhile, 
Jeanne had a tight hold on the bell rope itself. Give it up, Jeanne, Lael said, not without some sympathy. You've nowhere left to run now. Run? Jeanne retorted with manic glee. I have no need to run. All I need to do is ring this bell. All the members of the day parliament will come running, wondering why it is early, why only a single bell. And I will tell them how I was being threatened by a crazed nice speaker and his strange off-world conspirators. You, she continued, pointing at Lael, were trying to destroy the day parliament and take control of Monda solely for the night. And these aliens were using their strange powers as your assassins. And who would take your dubious word over mine, night speaker? Jeanne practically spat out the word night. Leo looked uncertain and for a moment was lost for words. Wait, the doctor cried. Haven't you forgotten something? As he asked this, the doctor moved out of the way of the door, allowing the day speaker a clear view of the lawn and the quadrangle beyond. Forgotten what? Jian sneered contemptuously. That, when you ask for aid from the creatures of the bulk, there is always a price. As the doctor said this, the faintest of chirrups came from the recesses of his jacket. Jian laughed. Price? What price? The doctor gestured with his hand towards the open door. At first it seemed nothing had changed. Then, faint at first, almost as if it was a gentle breeze, there came a rustling. The doctor led Romana and the night speaker out onto the lawn. The day speaker followed them as far as the door, but kept her hands on the end of the rope. The door itself had been flung outwards when they entered just moments before, and the doctor now leaned on it nonchalantly, pinning it against the wall of the tower. Just then the rustling became a roar, as a black mass erupted from under the eaves of the quadrangle buildings to pour down their sides towards the lawn. The giggling, squeaking, gibbering mass then began rolling across that same lawn, converging on the bell tower and their small group. It's time to pay the piper, the doctor said grimly. Jeanne looked about in ever-increasing panic. The doctor gestured towards one of the exits from the quadrangle, which led to one of the bridges to the rest of the city. As of yet, it had not quite been cut off by the mass of black rats. You know, if you're lucky, I think you might just outdistance them. The doctor supplied helpfully. For a moment, Jeanne did not move, frozen in terror. The doctor looked her square in the eyes. Run, speaker, run. Then she was off, running for all she was worth towards the exit to the bridge. As she ran, the entire swarm of otherworldly rodents changed direction to zero in on her ever-changing position, converging on her and swarming in pursuit. She disappeared through the bridge exit, closely followed by the rat horde. As the black rats continued to flow out of the buildings, lawn and quadrangle, Romana turned to the doctor. Do you think she'll make it? Romana asked. The doctor watched as the last few straggler, bulk-infested rat creatures left through the bridge exit. Perhaps she seemed quite fast. Just then they heard a distant scream, then all was silence. How did you know the bull creatures would turn on her? Ah, well, the doctor began slightly sheepishly, I may have loaded the dice a little. Romana pulled a face. Doctor, what did you do? Ahem. <clears throat> when we were examining the brass sphere back at the TARDIS, it may have become recharged. He then withdrew his sonic screwdriver from his pocket. I may have inadvertently nudged this when I put my hands in my pockets. There is a slight possibility that it may have reactivated the sphere. At that moment, the bell from the other tower rang out, taking them all by surprise. I don't know how I'm going to explain all this, Lael said, bemused, as the members of the day and night parliament began to wander onto the lawn, confused by the lonely single bell. The doctor turned to regard the night speaker. You know, perhaps this might be the ideal opportunity to make some changes. How so? Lael responded. Well, I'm hardly one to tell you how to organise yourselves. However, day, night, different size they might be, but one coin, one planet, one world. Perhaps you might want to find a way to work more closely together. Otherwise, one day, you might find unity thrust upon you externally and I doubt that would be pleasant. Lael frowned and stroked his chin. 
Eventually he looked up at the doctor. I shall give your words some thought. The doctor smiled. I couldn't ask for more. With that, the doctor and Romana left him and walked back into the Parliament chamber, heading for the TARDIS. As they neared the time machine, Romana asked, Who were the three tyrants? The doctor raised an eyebrow. Well, whether it was the world of politics or the realm of multidimensional mechanics, they certainly seemed to be the masters of manipulation. Romana nodded to herself. Yes, I thought so. Thank <laughs> you.